Welcome to the second video from the ACLS Certification Institute on Neonatal Resuscitation. The ACLS Certification Institute is found at www.aclscertification.com. And let's start off where we left off on the last video. And we had uh, just talked about the algorithm for resuscitating a newly born infant. And uh, we talked about the heart rate was less than 100. We would start positive pressure ventilation, and we would do that and see if that improved the heart rate to bring it above 100. If it didn't, we would try to fix our ventilation somehow, and then we would check again. And if the heart rate was below 60, we were saying that we would have to use some more drastic measures, and that's where we are right now in this box here. And so when the heart rate is less than 60, the next thing we need to start considering is intubation, chest compressions, and those chest compressions need to be coordinated with the ventilations. So let's first talk about intubations. So the authors of the manuscript from which the uh, NRP, Neonatal Resuscitation Program, is taken from, uh, list four different times where uh, intubation may be indicated. The first is if you have that non-vigorous meconium stained infant, as we talked about, and we need to do it for endotracheal suctioning. The next one is if you're going to be doing prolonged uh, ventilations, positive pressure ventilations, or if they're just not working. So you need to do intubation to get better ventilations. Mr. Sopa is not cutting it for us. If we need to go to chest compressions, and that's another time that you need to do it, and there are some special circumstances, things such as babies born with a diaphragmatic hernia or maybe extremely low birth weight babies. And as we said, the best way to see that this is a we're achieving good ventilations the best indicator that the tube is in the tracheobronchial tree is a prompt rise in the heart rate you can also look at things like those end tidal co2 detectors and those are those devices as we talked about in one of the videos that change colors when co when it detects co2 so it'll go from purple to yellow purple to yellow those work pretty well in kids as well but of course, it's important to understand how these things work to know why it wouldn't possibly not work. So remember that CO2 is picked up from the body, delivered through the blood to the lungs, and then exhaled. And that's where the end tidal CO2 detector is going to pick it up. So in order for this to work, you have to have this whole system functioning. And so that requires a heart that is pumping blood past body tissues, which are creating CO2. Then it gets into the blood, and the heart pumps it to the lungs, and then the lungs get to it to the end tidal CO2 detector. So, if we've intubated someone, and then we put the end tidal CO2 detector on, and it never changes from, never changes to yellow, it always stays purple, what does that mean? Well, that's a negative reading, that means we're not detecting CO2. So that could be one of two different reasons. Number one is we didn't intubate the trachea. Perhaps it went into the esophagus. And number two, it might be in the trachea, but there's just no pulmonary blood flow. So even though the tube is in the right place, there's just no carbon dioxide getting to the lungs to be exhaled, to be picked up by this detector. So when you want to confirm your intubation, look for other things. Look for condensation in the tube, because you'll see you know, the, the moisture from the lungs Condense, you know, condensing in the, in the endotracheal tube. Look for chest wall movement. Both sides should be moving symmetrically as well. Listen for equal breath sounds bilaterally, both lungs. I usually listen in the armpits. So that's the discussion on intubation. The other thing in this box that they talk about is chest compression. So let's take a second to talk about that. So there are actually quite a few important points we need to go over with chest compressions. The first is where do you do it? And you give it, you do it on the lower third of the sternum. And then this, if this is the diameter of the chest, then you want to give it, you want to perform the chest compressions that go to a depth of about one third the diameter of the chest. And then there are two ways to do the chest compressions. So imagine that this is a baby that requires chest compressions. The first is called the two thumbs encircling method. And what that means is you put, you wrap your hands around the child and put your thumbs on the sternum. So as you can see here, the blue hands represent the rescuer and the thumbs are here and the hands kind of, 
the rest of the fingers go around the back and then you could compress here with your thumbs. And this is actually the preferred technique. The only problem with it is if you need to get access to the umbilical stump, uh, then this person's probably going to be in the way. So then there's another technique you can use, and that's called the two finger, two finger technique. In this one, one hand goes behind the baby uh, along its back, and the other one, and then the other hand, uh, using two fingers, can come in and give chest compressions again on the sternum. While the, while, the other, while the other hand is supporting the back. Now this is beneficial in that should you need to get access to the umbilical stump, you can. Because a person giving chest compressions is all on one side, and so you get the access to the stump on the other side. And so those are the two different ways to give chest compressions, and remember the two thumbs encircling is the preferred way. And there's a few more important points that we need to make. The first is you want to give about 120 events per minute. And an event is really one of two things. It's either a, a chest compression or a breath. But it's one or the other. You can't give both at the same time because while you're giving a chest compression in these small, small infants, it's going to impede uh, the breath going in. So you need to really coordinate these. And since we're, we said earlier we want to give 40 to 60 breaths per minute, and since we're, we're giving 120, there's a, you want to give a 3 to 1 ratio of compressions to ventilations. So it's going to be 90 compressions to every 30 breaths approximately. So you might want to count it out like this. Squeeze, 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 breathe. Squeeze, 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 breathe. And when you squeeze, you do a chest compression. When you breathe, you give a breath. But again, you do not give a squeeze and a breath at the same time. So this 3 to 1 ratio is important because you, you remember like in pediatrics we were doing 15 to 2 in PALS uh, or in adults, 15 to 2. But in these neonates, we know that the thing that's very important is the breathing. So we want to give uh, breathing more often. If you know for some reason that it's a cardiac cause, you can do 15 uh, to 2. But uh, for the most part, you want to just do the 3 to 1 because it's most of the time it's a respiratory issue. So this is a quick overview here of our chest compressions. We give it bottom one-third of the sternum, one-third diameter of the chest. We have two techniques, two thumbs encircling or the two-finger technique. And we're going to give... Uh, one event every half second or 120 events a minute. We're going to go squeeze, 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 breathe, squeeze, 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 breathe. That's a three to one ratio. So let's go back to the algorithm for a second. And we see now that we've intubated our patient. We're doing the three to one, uh, three compressions to every one breath. We're coordinating with the positive plantar ventilation. Now, if the heart rate still remains less than 60, then it's time to give IV epinephrine. And you'll see this is the only drug that appears in this algorithm. And the dose is 0 0.01 to 0 0.03 milligrams per kilogram IV. And you remember we're going to be giving the 1 to 10,000 dilution. Not to be confused with the 1 to 1,000 dilution, which we are not giving. That one is too concentrated. We're going to give the more dilute 1 to 10,000 concentration. So we've made our way through this entire algorithm now. And we can see that it's, there's actually a lot to it that we need to do with the initial steps, the intubation, and even the chest compressions. Uh, in the next video, I'm going to go over this in a summary because there's a lot going on here. And I think it's important that we understand what, uh, you know, get a, get a better, bigger picture. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.